Okay, good. So welcome to the next um, um, CIE, Cambridge International Exams uh, A2, uh, A-Level Chemistry. And this is the paper four from uh, the winter series uh, in 2015. It's a two-hour paper, uh, paper four, uh, structured questions. And the approach we're going to take uh, for this paper to try and uh, speed through to our paper in the limited amount of time that we've got is to focus on the things that the uh, examiner's report say that most students get wrong. All right, so we'll skip through some things that you can see in the mark scheme that are quite easy, but when we get to a hot spot of difficulty, then those are the things we're going to focus uh, our time on today. Okay, very good. All right, so uh, you start off here. Uh, these are things that uh, you can check in the mark scheme, you can look up for yourself. Um, you've got, uh, when you come to um, C part one, strangely enough, uh, the examiner noted that uh, you've got to say, well, what happens when calcium nitrate is heated strongly? Um, and you can see here that um, the examiner highlighted that there's one mark for the question, but actually, if you look in the ca question carefully, it says, identify the white solid and give another observation. So this is usually where you'd expect to find two marks, but there's only one mark. So a lot of students weren't getting the one mark because they only put one thing down instead of putting both things down. So you, uh, what's going on here is you've got uh, calcium nitrate. The nitrates of group two are thermally unstable. And when you heat it, you get, cal um, what did I say? It's calcium nitrate. Uh, you get calcium oxide. You get uh, nitrogen dioxide gas. You get some oxygen gas as well. Balance all that up. And so they're saying, well, what's the white solid? Well, it's pretty obvious what that is because these other two are gases. So the white solid is calcium oxide. And another observation, well, you can't see oxygen. <laughs> so that leaves the only observation that's there is to see that we've got the nitrogen dioxide gas, which is brown. All right, so if you two marks, white calcium oxide, brown nitrogen dioxide gas, two marks. All right, so <clears throat> you've got to explain the trend. Uh, well, what's going on here is that as you go down the group, you've got, uh, say, magnesium nitrate at the top. And as you go down the group, you might get to barium nitrate. And the thermal stability, or the, <clears throat> the it's basically easier to do thermal decomposition of this than it is to do thermal decomposition of this. And the reason is that the magnesium iron is much smaller than the barium iron. And so you've got greater charge density. And that means that the uh, nitrate iron if you just look up here, you can see that we've got to break that nitrate iron up, haven't we, into an NO2 molecule. So we're breaking an NO bond. And this uh, strong positive charge density can polarize the nitrogen oxide bond and break it much more than the weaker positive charge density around the barium 2 plus iron. And the thing that the examiner <laughs> picked up in all of that, you could read all that in the mark scheme, is that when people, uh, students talked about this, um, they were talking about, or they should have been talking about, the ionic radius, which is increasing down the group, isn't it? And sometimes students were talking about the atomic radius, which also increases down the group, but on this occasion you're talking about cations. So you must be talking about ionic radius to get your two marks rather than the atomic radius. Okay, just a, a point that the examiner picked up on there. All right, uh, there's a definition there. You can look that one up. Uh, then you've got this uh, little, uh, well, there's a big hint there, isn't it? You've got to do an enthalpy uh, calculation. And it says, oh, by the way, it's helpful to draw an energy cycle. So, you know, that's a pretty clear hint that you're expected to do that. 
And the energy cycle you're going to draw is you've got to find out, haven't you, the lattice energy for calcium nitrate. And the lattice energy, well, you need to know that lattice energy is when you've got gaseous ions. There's the calcium ion that's gaseous. And you've got these two nitrate ions that are gaseous. And so the lattice energy is when those gaseous ions become calcium nitrate solid. That's the lattice energy. That one from gaseous ions uh, to the solid ionic compound. Um, <clears throat> it also tells you uh, these uh, enthalpies of hydration over here. And that's when these gaseous ions, there they are, still those two, don't become an ionic solid, but become uh, completely dissolved in water. So here we've got, that's the ionic solid. And over here, you've got uh, the, the ions. And, and the two of those, isn't that dissolved in water. And so that's the, all the um, enthalpies of hydration. And then there's one other step, which is the enthalpy of solution, which is when you take that solid, just run the state symbol there, and you dissolve it so you get the calcium ion and the nitrate ions in water. So they give you that, don't they? Which is the enthalpy change of solution. Let's call that delta H1. That's delta H1 there. You're trying to find this. We don't know what that is. And you should know then, you should be able to calculate the uh, enthalpy change here because you're dissolving these gaseous ions in water over here. And so you've got two lots of enthalpy of hydrations. You've got the enthalpy of hydration of calcium, that one there. And then the thing that the examiner picked up on is that, well, you've got the enthalpy of hydration of the nitrate, Yes, going from the nitrate ion as a gas. Excuse me, I've, I've written the um, oh. that's one negative there, isn't it? My mistake. So we've got the enthalpy of hydration of the calcium ion. And we've got the enthalpy of hydration of the nitrate ion. What am I doing? That's minus one there. And the examiner picked up on that a lot of students got that enthalpy of hydration and they got that enthalpy of hydration but they forgot to say, well, actually, there's two nitrate ions being hydrated. So in our calculation, you've got to multiply that by two. And that was the thing that was tripping up a lot of students. So <clears throat> your final enthalpy calculation is to say, well, um, the energy change going from here to here is the same as the energy change going from here down to here. And so you've got uh, a calculation to do to say that on the right-hand side over here, the enthalpy of hydration of the calcium ion plus the enthalpy of hydration of a nitrate ion, and remember there's two of those, equals the lattice energy, which is the thing you're trying to do, find out, plus the... Um, enthalpy of solution of the calcium nitrate. And if you rearrange the equation, so you make this the subject to the equation, then you get the answer that you need there. And so the thing that the examiner was wanting you to make sure was that you don't forget that you've got two lots of the enthalpy of hydration of the nitrate ion. And that's where a lot of students lost uh, some marks. Okay, next one then. Um, still talking about enthalpy change of hydration. 
and comparing uh, barium iron, comparing that with calcium iron. And again, a lot of students compared these two and compared the size of the ions. And so you're talking again here about ionic radius, and you're not talking about atomic radius. So atomic radius is wrong. You're talking about these ions being dissolved in water. And the calcium ion has a smaller ionic radius than the barium ion. And the other language you need to look for here is that when these ions dissolve in water, if I can draw it, let's take the calcium ion, you've got the positive charge there. And so you get an electrostatic force of attraction between the negative dipole of a water molecule. So you've got a water molecule there, it's got a positive end and a negative end, and you've got the language here is electrostatic force of attraction. You can see there's a, a positive charge on the calcium ion and a partial negative charge on the oxygen atom. There's an electrostatic force of attraction and the best way to describe that force of attraction is to say you've got an iron dipole attraction. Yeah, that's, that's really good language that you can use there. So you know, you're not really sure what to call that force of attraction between the calcium ion and the, uh, the slightly negatively charged oxygen, oxygen. But if you use this language, it's an electrostatic force of attraction or it's an iron dipole attraction, then you're using very good scientific language to explain that you get a stronger attraction for the smaller calcium ion and you get a weaker attraction for the larger barium ion. And that's the reason that the barium ion gives you a less exothermic uh, entropy of hydration. So the uh, examiner was picking up uh, ionic radius and the kind of language you can use down here. Good. All right. Uh, going through, um, you can just, <clears throat> those are pretty easy to look up, the number of unpaired electrons, or you can work that out. Uh, all of these other things you can look up in the mark scheme, you can check in your books, keeping on going. Strangely enough, you know, the examiner said that a lot of students hadn't learned a definition for transition element. All right. So again, that's in the mark scheme. That's in your book. That's just something to learn. And the examiner said, well, you know, a lot of students hadn't learned that one. So big uh, exclamation mark there. That's something for you guys to really, you know, write it out a few times, try and understand what it means, uh, get the definition in there of the transition element. All right, so now uh, we're starting to talk about complex ions, and there's a whole uh, section here about ligands, the type of bonding that occurs between a ligand and a tr transition element. Well, you're using either dative bonding. Another word for that is coordinate. Either of those is absolutely uh, perfectly acceptable. Um, and both of those mean exactly the same thing, that um, you have a bond, and normally in a covalent bond, you get one electron from one atom and another electron from another atom. They share the electrons. Here, the coordinate bond or the dative bond is formed by a lone pair of electrons being donated completely from the ligand. And that's, you know, when you get to these kind of questions, they're actually, they're helping you through the question because you're thinking about the kind of bonding here, and you know that the ligand will donate a lone pair of electrons. That's what these dative or coordinate bonds mean, that the ligand is donating a lone pair of electrons. And so when you come down to here, and you're trying to think, well, which ones of these are ligands, you've got to be looking out for a lone pair of electrons that can be donated. And of course, the one that stands out a mile is this one here. You can see that on the nitrogen there, you've got a lone pair of electrons, and there you've got a lone pair of electrons. So actually this ligand can form two dative bonds, two coordinate bonds, 
and that's called uh, just for the sake of checking it um, if I get my spelling right by dentate because it can form two of these um, uh, coordinate bonds so by dent eight okay dent is like a Latin word for tooth or something. So you can imagine you've got two bonds biting into the complex. Um, so that was an easy one. That that can act as a ligand. Oops, down here. Yep. Now this one's fairly easy as well. You know that in ammonia, there is a lone pair of electrons, isn't there? So ammonia can act as a ligand, that's good, but they're playing with your head a little bit here because this looks like ammonia, but it's not because the lone pair of electrons has been used up in forming a bond to a proton. Yeah? So actually, there's no lone pair of electrons available anymore to act as a ligand, so you've got to watch out for that. It looks like something that you're familiar with. You know that ammonia can form a ligand, but this ammonium ion, there's no lone pair of electrons left, so it cannot act as a ligand. Well, well you get a tick there, don't you, to say it cannot act. Okay. In uh, boron trifluoride, there's no lone pair of electrons that can act as a ligand. And here, there is a lone pair of electrons that can act as a ligand. If you draw out the structure for nitrate, you've got... Actually, I don't know if that's covered in your books anywhere, but you've got, I'm drawing the bond, this is called a Lewis diagram, and you've got a negative charge there, a negative charge there, you've got a positive charge on the nitrogen in the middle, and it's these lone pairs of electrons here that can form a dative or coordinate covalent bond. So <clears throat> the nitrate iron, yes, it's got lone pairs of available. It can form one of these dative uh, or coordinate uh, bonds as part of a complex. Good. Uh, examiner seemed to think that uh, all of these were answered quite well. You could look those up in the mark scheme. Now, this one... You're going to have to really bear with me on this one because <clears throat> the examiner is saying that in this position and in other places in the paper that where students go wrong is drawing mechanisms. Okay, so a lot of students get mechanisms wrong. And <laughs> the mechanism in the mark scheme is itself wrong. Okay? <laughs> So, we, and, and you'll, you'll see why as we go through the, this. So, <clears throat> and actually, if, if people are on the Slack channel and they disagree with me, then um, talk to me in the Slack channel. But basically, if you look up here, what kind of chemical is that? You've got a carbon atom joined to a halide, chlorine, and you've got three methyl groups around it. Yes, that's what you've got, isn't it? And that is a tertiary alkyl halide. Okay, tertiary. If you had a primary, it would be something like this, wouldn't it? Just a straight chain alkane and a halide at the end. So that, that's a primary. Okay, but we're talking about a tertiary here. And if you check in every single textbook, then they, and we'll see why in a moment, then you get something called an SN1 mechanism for tertiaries and an SN2 mechanism for primaries. Okay, and in the Mark scheme, they give an SN2 mechanism. But it should be an SN1 mechanism. So why that's in the mark scheme, I, I, I can't tell. And, and actually, the question, you'll see the question is supportive later on of an SN1 mechanism. Okay? Because as you work through the question, it says, well, this is an SN1 mechanism later on. In, 
it kind of Im implies that. Okay, so <clears throat> um, let's just put that in a box and just kind of leave it there for the moment. But these primary uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, alkyl halides form SN2 mechanisms. We're talking about an SN1 mechanism here. I'll just clean this up a bit. Uh, okay, let me draw that again. So, because we're going to, the, the examiner is really, really saying that you've got to draw these mechanisms very, very carefully. So, the mechanism for SN1 is here's your tertiary alkyl halide. And you can see that I'm making sure that I've got carbon carbon bonds. So, I've drawn that as a CH3 and I've written that as an H3C. Okay, I don't want any. Um, if you if you wrote that as CH three, it looks like the hydrogen is being bonded to two carbons, which it isn't. So you, you have it that way around, and you've got um, you've got the chlorine there, and so your first step in this mechanism is you draw the curly arrow like that. And you should be very, very careful with these curly arrows that you show where they start and you must show where they finish. And so here, you've got a pair of electrons in a bond. So I've started the arrow in a bond and the pair of electrons are going to end up on the chloride ion. So you've got to show that you start on the bond and you finish on the atom. Yeah? So that's then going to... And you end up with, there's the, um, the pair of electrons ended up on the chlorine atom. So that's a chloride ion now. And you've got a positive charge left on the carbon. And that's called um, carbocation. We're just spending a bit of time on this because it's one of the things that the examiner, well, in this case, the question mark scheme seems wrong, but they, they seem to be wanting to be very, very, uh, attentive to the way we draw mechanisms. Um, <clears throat> so that's um, the uh, intermediate here. And th the reason that that intermediate forms is because it's stable. Because you have what's called a positive inductive effect. Electrons are released from that methyl group, that methyl group, that methyl group. And so the carbon there means that the charge gets spread out across the whole carbocation. And so it's a stable carbocation because you've got a tertiary uh, alkyl halide here. So that's uh, our intermediate. And you're reacting this, aren't you, with sodium hydroxide. So here comes our hydroxide and you're expected in these mechanisms to make sure that you're showing lone pairs of electrons and we've got a negative charge on there. And again, just like we drew the curly arrow here, you're showing where the electrons are starting and where they're ending up. So here they're starting in uh, a lone pair of electrons and they're going to end up making a bond. So you're drawing a curly arrow down to here. And so we end up at the end of the reaction with the three methyl groups that have been there all along and this new bond that's been formed between the oxygen and the positive charge of the carbocation. And that's the end of the mechanism. And that's... Um, an SN1 mechanism, well, S means we're doing a substitution. You can see that we've substituted an uh, OH for a chloride. We've done a substitution. And N means nucleophilic, doesn't it? Nucleophilic means that the um, reagent likes positive charges. 
um, philic uh, from Greek means to like something or to love something. And the uh, nucleus of an atom is positive. So it's something that likes positive charges. And sure, you had a hydroxide ion that liked the positive charge in the carbocation. So substitution, nucleophilic, and this is the important point, SN1. And what that means is that when you look at the kinetics of this reaction, there's only one species, only one chemical in the rate determining step. Okay, And you can see here, you've got in the SN1 mechanism, you've got a slow step and you've got a fast step. Okay, there's essentially there's two steps to this process. And losing the chloride ion is slow. And once it's gone, it gets rapidly substituted by a hydroxide because they, they're attracted to each other. They just uh, <coughs> uh, bond very quickly. So you've got a slow step and a fast step. And you'll see later on that when you write a rate equation, then the things that are in the rate equation feature in the slow step. So later on, you see, it says that the rate of this reaction is equal to a rate constant times the concentration only of this. The hydroxide ion isn't in the rate equation at all. So the hydroxide ion uh, is not involved at all in this slow step. And so that tells us that it's an SN1 reaction. And the Mark scheme is, is, for some reason, saying it's SN2. If it was an SN2 reaction, then both the hydroxide and the alkyl halide would be involved in a slow step, but they're not. Only the alkyl halide is involved in the slow step, and so it's a genuine SN1 reaction. Good, um, <clears throat> but the the point that the examiner is making is you've got to be really, really careful about your mechanisms with the curly arrow showing where uh, the electron started and where they ended up. Started in a bond, ended on an atom. Here, started on an atom, ended in a bond. Yeah? And you've got to show lone pairs of electrons. So, uh, and we're, but there's, there's another mechanism a bit later on in the paper where uh, the examiner again is commenting that students aren't drawing their mechanisms very, very carefully. Okay, uh, good, moving on then. Um, so, uh, talks about a half life, and you had to show that the time for the concentration to half was constant. That's the half life. Okay, so we're starting, what's that, 58. Half of that gets us to 29. And so that takes us to, that's about 50 seconds. And that was halving from 58, sorry, 0.58 to 0.29. Halving that again, what's that? So that's uh, <laughs> 14 and a half, yes? Half of that? Okay, so that's about there, isn't it? So if you go follow that along, it comes down to here. Oh, that's 100, okay? So the difference between there and there was 50 seconds. Half the concentration again. The time between there and there was another 50 seconds. And if you, uh, <clears throat> and so we truly have got a constant half-life, the time required for the concentration to fall by half. And um, what the examiner um, noticed was that a lot of students didn't use, strangely enough, the word concentration in their definition of a half-life. The half-life is the time taken for the concentration of a reactant to fall by half. And for some reason, students were writing definitions, but they weren't including the word concentration um, in their descriptions. And we calculated the half-life of this reaction, uh, and it ends up at about 50 seconds. And again, <clears throat> down here, they're kind of playing with your head a bit, because in this, we saw here, didn't we, 
that the half-life is constant for a first a first order reaction the half-life is constant it halved uh, there took 50 seconds it halved again took another 50 seconds the half-life is constant and so they come down here and say well what would happen to the half-life if we change the concentration well nothing because the half-life is constant so it's a kind of trick you know it's almost a trick question that they're playing on you there so what would be the effect of the half-life well no effect because in a first order reaction the half-life is constant and we found that out from the graph anyway <clears throat> the time taken for the concentration to half is 50 seconds all right Again, the examiner's saying, well, students should know how to calculate a rate of reaction. And this, because it's telling us the rate of reaction at a particular time, that's called um, the rate at a particular instant, or instant, the better word for that, is an instantaneous rate. And so <clears throat> the rate of reaction is the change in concentration over the change in time. I'm just using delta to mean a change there. This is an instantaneous rate. What is the change in concentration at that instant? 80 seconds. And so what you do is you need to look back at the graph, find 80 seconds. There it is. What's the rate there? Well, the way to do that is you need to get your ruler line that just touches the graph at 80 seconds. And for some reason, <coughs> the examiner said that students weren't drawing a tangent. I guess they might have been doing some other calculation. But once you've drawn your tangent, then you need to work out the gradient of the tangent. Now, I've seen other mark schemes where the examiners have taken off marks if the tangent came above the line for some reason which is, that's not a tangent, is it? You've got to have a tangent is just touching the line at 80 seconds. And then you work out your change in Y, and you work out your change in X. That's the change in concentration, isn't it? And that's your change in time. And you can work out the rate of reaction at 80 seconds. It's an instantaneous rate. And so finally, in the, the question you see, well, it says the rate is um, the rate times the rate constant times only the concentration of the uh, tertiary alkyl halide. And that must mean that it's SN1 because there's only one concentration that's being measured there. If it was SN2, then the rate would be equal to the rate constant times the alkyl halide times the concentration of the hydroxide ion. That would be SN2, and this is SN1. So they tell us the rate is SN1 from that rate equation. So that must mean, going all the way back up here, that we had the SN1 mechanism and not the SN2 mechanism. So there's a kind of internal contradiction in the question. Um, and if you follow it through to the end, you end up with an SN1 mechanism, and that must mean we need to draw that particular mechanism um, <clears throat> right at the start. And to work out the uh, rate constant, all you're doing is you're substituting uh, values into this equation here. You just have to rearrange it to make k, the rate constant, the subject of the equation. So you've got to do the rate divided by the concentration. Now the rate you just calculated up here, didn't you, when you drew your tangent? So we know our rate and we know our concentration. We can read it off there. And we just have to calculate the rate constant by dividing the rate that we calculated by the concentration that we can read off the graph. 
And the examiner basically said that uh, lots of students found that quite easy because it's just maths. You're just rearranging an equation, making the rate constant the subject of the equation, and plugging in numbers. Good. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> well, the examiner said that students drew um, cell diagrams very, very well. You can look those up in a book. Uh, I'm not going into it now. Basically, students draw cell diagrams um, uh, very well. No problem with that. And again, uh, conditions. Uh, again, you can look that up. Uh, students know that the conditions are one mole per decimeter cubed uh, for the concentration. They need one atmosphere for the uh, pressure. And you need 298K for the temperature. Those are all pretty well known. Students know those. Strangely enough, students lost marks for hit this one. And I think possibly what it is, is that in physics, of course, you learn that current is moving electrons. But actually, current is more widely defined as moving charges. Now, of course, a current in a wire, the only charges that can move around are the electrons. So that's why we think of current as moving electrons, but really, current is any charge that's moving. So, well, that's easy, isn't it? In the wire, you know, there's only one thing that's moving through the wire, that's the electrons, that's the normal way of thinking about current. But what's moving in solution, of course, are ions. You, might, you In this case, they gave you X plus, didn't they? So you've got uh, an X plus ion that's moving in solution. And anything that's charged and moving is a current. So for some reason, students were getting that, but weren't getting that. And to get this is another question where you have to get both parts to get your one mark. So you would have thought that might have been two marks, but it's uh, just one mark. <coughs> and then the big uh, problem that the examiner uh, highlighted was this step here of... Uh, a half cell, which is silver, and this other half cell, which is that one here. So we'll just spend a little bit of time going through that because the examiner highlighted this as one of the things that students found most difficult. But really, we shouldn't really get too stuck on this because uh, you have to remember that in these cells, of course, you're thinking about two electrodes that are pointing into solutions. And so you just have to think about, well, if you've got two electrodes, one is going to be the positive electrode, one's going to be the negative. The one that's going to be <coughs> attracting electrons is going to be the positive electrode. And the one that's going to be losing electrons is going to be the negative electrode. So it's pretty obvious which is the positive and which is the negative electrode. But these uh, half cells, these electropotentials, are always written as reductions. Okay, now... So there's, and we've, we've got in our heads, haven't we, this oil rig mnemonic. So oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. These um, electropotentials are always written as reductions, electrons being gained. So there's two, uh, they're actually equilibrium, aren't they? So those are the two, <clears throat> um, standard electrode potentials, and it's saying that this one is 0 0.4 volts, and this one is going to be plus 8 volts. And so we have to figure out, well, out of these two, even though they're both written as reductions, in reality, one will be a reduction, one will be an oxidation, and the oxidation is going to be the one that loses electrons. The reduction is going to be the one that gains electrons. And so, well, look at these standard electrode potentials. One is negative. Well, what's that going to do? That's going to be losing electrons, isn't it? And the one that's positive, it's going to be gaining electrons. Reduction is gain. So that one must be the reduction. And this one because it's losing electrons, must be the oxidation. Okay, so that means we've got to turn one of these around, 
And the one that gets turned around is the one that is losing electrons, which is this one here, isn't it? So we're going to take that one and turn it round. So let's just take that one out of the picture for a moment and turn it round. That's going to be going to that. Plus your up. Now, because it's so easy to get mixed up here, let me just do a quick sanity check. Okay, all right. So what's happening there? That's gaining of electrons. So that's electrons being gained. Gaining of electrons is reduction. Um, <clears throat> and the most positive uh, standard electrode potential is going to be gaining electrons. So that's good. The most negative one is going to be losing electrons. This is losing electrons. Yep, that's good. So that's losing electrons. That must be oxidation. There's lots of ways of checking this. Okay, and oxidation would have the oxidation number going up, wouldn't it? So that's going from zero to plus two. That's an oxidation. Okay, so <clears throat> we've got our two half equations sorted out. And then the thing the examiner said, strangely enough, was that for some reason students were then <laughs> putting a two, like the silver. <laughs> I don't know why they were doing that. <laughs> anyway, so that's not right. Silver is just a single plus. There it is. But the silver is gaining one electron. The X, whatever that is, is losing two electrons. And so to combine those two together, you've got to multiply that one by two. Well, you don't have to do anything this one. You're multiplying it by one. So that's two, two electrons, two silver. And when you add those together, you get two silver with a single charge, plus the two electrons that came from up there, plus this X, whatever that is, and that's going to two silver over there, plus the X, two plus iron, plus two electrons. We just added equation one and equation two together. And then you can see here that we can just cancel out those two electrons. I can even do that with the rubber tool. And You've got two silver ions, write the state symbols in. You've got the solid metal there, gives you solid silver and um, uh, the X two plus iron. So you've got a, a stoichiometry here, haven't you, of two to one. And for some reason, the examiner was saying a lot of students didn't get the right stoichiometry. Yeah? You just have to make sure that you have the right number of electrons to cancel out when you combine the two half equations. Good. All right. So a little bit of a calculation here. You worked out the uh, stoichiometry. You've got two silver ions plus the X metal is going to two silver metal plus the X2, uh, two plus iron. And when I'm doing this, uh, just to keep myself on track, uh, I write down, well, in the question they're giving me the mass. Uh, so the, the, we've got a gain in mass there of 1.3. And the amount of um, uh, X2 plus iron that's being formed is 0 0.67. All right. And then you should also know, you can just look that up in the data book. You can look up the molar mass uh, for those. Um, molar mass for silver is 107.9. And because you've got a mass and you've got a molar mass, you can work out the amount. That's the amount in moles. And so you've got 0 0.01205 moles of silver. And then you've got, you just have to check your stoichiometry here. If you've got two of silver, two moles of silver, you'll have one mole of um, the X, whatever that is. And so the number of moles is, of X is half the number of moles of silver. So you've got to take that number there and divide it by two to give yourself the number of moles of X, which is my calculation, that many grams. All right, so I've got mass, molar mass amount. I'm just keeping myself organized by writing rows there. Okay, so we've got the uh, amount, and then you've got to work out, haven't you, uh, an identity for x. 
Okay. Well, if you knew its relative atomic mass, then it'd be easy to look up in the periodic table that they give you. And so if you want to work out a relative atomic mass, you first got to work out the molar mass for X. All right. And you can get that there, can't you? Because you've got the mass and you've got the amount, the number of moles. And the molar mass then is just going to be the mass, small m, divided by the number of moles down there. And the mass that we worked out, or they told us, was 0.67 grams. The number of moles, the amount, we worked out there. And that gives us a molar mass, if I do that calculation, of 112, sorry, 111.2. And the molar mass is in grams per mole. But we <clears throat> want to go from a molar mass to a relative atomic mass. And the relationship between those two is, well, the relative atomic mass is the same as the molar mass without um, the number of moles there. Sorry, the, the, the unit of grams per mole. And if you look up in your periodic table, the closest thing that you can find is 112.4 uh, as the relative atomic mass uh, for cadmium. All right. So the relative atomic mass that you calculated was 101, sorry, 111.2. And the closest there is cadmium uh, that has a relative uh, atomic mass of uh, just over 112. So cadmium, cadmium is the one that goes in there. Good. Uh, balancing equations, the next one. Uh, just look that up. Uh, that's... Um, something you can do. <laughs> uh, and then coming down here to mechanisms again. Okay, And again, the examiner said, well, loads of students, they're not very good at mechanisms, even though in the question here, they're kind of giving you loads and loads of hints. So complete the mechanism. All right. And the thing that the examiner is looking for, we list the things, because there's three marks here, isn't there? Yeah. Is, first of all, if there's a dipole, the examiner wants to see that in the mechanism. Uh, dipole is formed when there's an electronegativity difference between two atoms. Well, there's one here between the carbon and the oxygen. So the examiner is expecting to see a small negative charge there and a small positive charge there. That's your first mark, looking for the dipole. Then uh, looking for pen. Curly. Arrows is the next thing. Uh, and the curly arrow, like we had earlier on, has to get a, got to go from to. <laughs> uh, and so here we are going from the lone pair. The examiner has kindly written that in to a bond. All right. So that's going from the lone pair and it's going to be forming a bond that's going to be coming in between the carbon and the hydrogen there. Do you see? That's where the curly arrow is going. And so the intermediate that you're going to get there, because uh, when the curly yellow arrow goes in there, then that's going to trigger that bond pair of electrons going there. And again, can you see I've gone from the bond to the atom here, from the lone pair to the bond. So we've been very, very precise about where these curly yellow arrows go. And you end up with an intermediate then, which has got the, uh, that group there, nothing happened to that. And that group over here, nothing happened to that. Can you see I've written with the carbon the right way around there? And so you formed that bond there, didn't you? From that lone pair coming into that space there. So that's a new bond that's been formed. And you've got uh, those electrons there moved from that double bond onto the oxygen atom. All right. So we did our dipoles. Yep, we got those in. The curly arrows. The other thing, because we've got three marks here that the examiner is looking for, is, well, whenever you do a reaction, any reaction actually, but mechanisms included, you can't go around losing charges. You know, you can't just lose things along the way. And you had a negative charge here. Well, you haven't drawn anything here yet. And that negative charge ends up up there. Yeah? Because that lone pair of electrons moved up there, 
and you ended up with a negative charge up there. So uh, the things that the examiner is looking for to get your three marks, nicely drawn mechanism, one mark for the dipole, two marks for the curly arrows from two, make sure they go very precise where they go from and where they go to, and make sure you don't leave any charges behind. Um, and the examiner's flagging that up as the typical things that students get wrong. Okay, uh, some of these things you can look up in the mark scheme. That's just an addition reaction that's happening there. Um, <clears throat> this one is pretty tricky because um, you've got to know that um, your well, they've put it in bold there, haven't they? This least substituted carbon. And that's giving you a clue, because if you wanted to look that up in your book, there's something called the Mark, Mark Kinov. Have I spelled that right? Markoninov. Russian chemist. There's a Markoninov rule that in these addition reactions, the addition is going to happen on the least substituted carbon. Now, if you look at this molecule over here, that carbon is the most substituted. It's got two methyl groups on it. And that carbon is the least substituted. It's just got one methyl group on it. And so the substitution doesn't happen there, that's the most substituted. The substitution happens there, that's the least substituted. And you can see that's the addition happening there. And so <clears throat> if you wanted to check that in your books, looking up the Markovnikov rule is the one that you want. Um, well, and then you, you've got to go from um, a diene, two double bonds, to a diol. And they've given you here a skeletal structure. Now, it takes some kind of mental work to work with skeletal structures. Um, I think it's much easier to draw out, just for your own sake, to draw out uh, a structure a bit like this. So this is the um, diene. You've got, uh, we normally draw dienes like that, you see, don't we, with a 120 degree bond like that. So you've got that, and you've got, whoops, pen's gone again, CH, CH3 up there, another 120 degree um, bond there, and then you're coming down to another double bond, and you've got a methyl group there, oops, and a methyl group there, and, well, you just need to look around that now and work out which ones are the least substituted. Well, it's not that, is it? Because that's got uh, a bond to a methyl group down there. Uh, and it's not that one either, because that's got a methyl group up there and all these uh, other things down here. So the least substituted is there and there. So that must be the diene that's used to make this diol over here, because you're using that rule of the addition is going to happen at the least substituted carbon. And if you draw it out like that, it's a little bit clearer. That's your diol. The least substituted carbon is there, and the least substituted carbon is there. Okay, all right. So <clears throat> Next thing uh, the examiner said is that, look at this, you've got, I mean, how much room have you got there? How many lines? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's probably the biggest space in the exam at all. And the examiner said, well, you know, I gave these students loads of space, but they didn't use it. They didn't fill in as much detail as they should have done. 
You've got loads of space, that's a pretty, pretty big clue, and you're getting three marks there. So at this point, you know you've just really, really got to go for it and fill in all that space with as much detail as possible. Examiner is saying, give me more detail. So um, uh, benzene, well, so when I was thinking about this, I would think, well, okay, you've got carbon atoms around there. And so for each carbon atom, that's going to form two bonds to other carbon atoms or adjacent carbon atoms. Because you've got a carbon atom there, a carbon atom there, a carbon atom there. Each carbon atom is forming two bonds to adjacent carbon atoms. And those bonds are sigma bonds. So you've got carbon, 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 carbon there. Right? And then you've also got um, another bond to hydrogen there as you go around. I could keep drawing those in. Okay, So the carbon atom has two bonds to adjacent carbon atoms. Those are sigma bonds. And one bond to hydrogen atom. And that's also a sigma bond. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you also need to know that um, the carbon atom in there is something called sp2 hybridized. So the carbon atom has sp2 hybridized atomic orbitals. We're really sort of packing this thing full of language here. So sp2 hybridized atomic orbitals. And when you have sp2 hybridization, you always get a bond angle of 120 degrees. So bond angle there for sp2 hybridization, bond angle is 120 degrees. Okay, so when you do sp2 hybridization and you work that through, what you find out is you end up with one p atomic orbital that's not hybridized. It just gets left on its own. So there's an unhybridized p orbital on the carbon. And that unhybridized p orbital has the classic p orbital shape, like a dumbbell. And so you end up with uh, all the carbons joined to the carbons with their sigma bonds. And then you've got your unhybridized p orbitals for each carbon. And there's one electron in each of those. And those unhybridized p orbitals, because they're close to each other there, they can form an overlap above and below the plane of the ring, above and below. And that overlap between p orbitals above and below the ring is called pi bond. So you've got overlap between the unhybridized p orbitals above and below the plane of the ring. <clears throat> and because the, you get a pi bond uh, here, 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 then you can end up with not just the pi bonds, but they spread themselves out to a delocalized ring of electrons. Okay, so you know we've just packed in as much detail as we can there using the best language that we've got. We've got uh, carbon, and it's making two sigma bonds to adjacent carbon atoms, and it's making a sigma bond to a hydrogen atom. The carbon atom is sp2 hybridized in its atomic orbitals, and sp2 hybridization gives bond angles of 120 degrees. That leaves one p orbital behind that's unhybridized. It has this shape here, and that shape means you can have sideways overlap between p orbitals. And that sideways overlap forms a pi bond, and the sideways overlap above and below the plane of the ring gives you a delocalized ring of electrons. Now, 
I only had to get three marks there. <laughs> I don't know if I could get six marks. I've probably got six marks in there as well because I've just packed all the language in there. But you're given a lot of space. You don't know exactly what's in the mark scheme, so you just really go for it and give them as much detail as you possibly can. And the examiner was complaining there wasn't enough detail from the students in the questions there. All right, uh, next one. <clears throat> You're looking at a uh, chemical you've not met before, and you end up with a very similar kind of structure, if you like, to um, benzene. And the clue is that you haven't got just single bonds or double bonds. You've got something that's in between. It's not uh, a double bond. Sorry, that's a single bond there, isn't it? Or a double bond. It's in between. And so you've got another delocalized uh, system of pi bonds there, uh, and you end up with a bond length that is intermediate between the single bond and the double bond, just like you have in benzene, actually. And so the examiner's complaint here was that students drew the ring. I mean, that's fairly obvious that you've got to draw that there, B3, N3, H6. You've got the hydrogen atoms there, like you had in uh, benzene. And the examiner said, well, that's OK. A lot of students drew that, but they didn't draw the delocalized ring uh, like you have in benzene for this molecule here, B3, N3, H6. So. Okay, good. Ah, right. <clears throat> um, so this one, um, well, you can look up the structures in the Marx scheme. Um, you end up later on, don't you, with a structure over here where you've got... I'll just draw this one in, but you can look up the rest of them in the Marx scheme. Uh, you've got uh, an arene there, and you've got, they tell you nothing ha nothing happens actually to this group over here. And you end up on here with this. All right. And that uh, uh, ring with this nitrogen, triple bonded to a nitrogen there, got a positive charge, you need to balance that with a chloride there. And that group there is a diazonium group. And because you've got uh, chloride, then you could say, well, that's a diazonium chloride. It's a diazonium salt. All right. And they didn't, <coughs> um, well, I suppose you, the, the thing you've got to watch here for is that the positive charge then is always written on that nitrogen there. Can you see it's actually got four bonds, one, two, three, four. So you end up with a positive charge on that nitrogen when you're drawing a diazonium group, which is part of a diazonium salt. Now, <coughs> they're very, very useful. They're used a lot in organic synthesis, but the problem with them is that you can lose them very easily. They're very, very unstable, or they're very, very reactive. And so to make them, you've got to keep the reaction very cool, otherwise they just go off and react or decompose. And so this step here is nice and cold. So you'd say less than 10 degrees C. And the complaint that the examiner had was that students could draw the um, uh, structures and could label the reagents, but the students didn't write the conditions. All right, Because later on, you come down here and they say, uh, suggests the reagents, da da da, and conditions. All right, so students are getting the reagents right, fantastic, but aren't getting the conditions in. And so the conditions are well, this step here, you need to keep really cold because these diazonium salts or that diazonium group is really reactive. So that's nice and cold. But this one here, you're doing a reduction, aren't you? You've got a, re you've got a reduction of that. <clears throat> Um, group that you've got here, and you're going to end up over here, if you look in the mark scheme, with an amine. You're reducing that group there. And that reduction, you're going to have to uh, use uh, tink, tink? <laughs> I'm thinking of zinc. <laughs> you're tin, tin. I'm thinking of tin and zinc at the same time. So that's tin. You've got to use tin and hydrochloric acid. 
And quite often when you're doing organic chemistry and you've got to wait for things to happen, then you've got to heat them. If you heat things, they evaporate. So to make sure you don't let everything evaporate while you're heating it, then you've got to heat it under reflux. And what that means is that something might evaporate and then it hits this uh, reflux tower, it cools down and drops back into the reaction flask. So um, <clears throat> the conditions that they're looking for down here then is, well, step one, you've got to have your tin and hydrochloric acid. You're going to heat it. And to make sure you don't lose things through evaporation, you're going to use reflux. Yes? So quite often in organic chemistry, you're heating with reflux. Um, and in step two, we're making this very reactive diazonium salt, so we've got to keep that cold. And oh, the reagent there was sodium nitrate, sorry, nitrite and hydrochloric acid. And you're going to keep that below 10 degrees Celsius. Otherwise, things react or decompose. And we've said already that the organic salt that we formed was a diazonium salt. All right, so make sure you don't forget your conditions. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> moving on. Okay, this one. Um, all right, we've got a little structure there. Again, they're testing, aren't they, your ability to see skeletal structures. All right? So it's much nicer if they've written out in a displayed formula. You can see all the bonds, but here you've got to work out a skeletal. Um, and while we're looking at it, well, it's got some functional groups on it there, hasn't it? There are these functional groups. Yeah. That one is an amine. That one there is an alkene. And that functional group there is a amide. All right, so we're probably going to get asked about those, those functional groups a bit later on. If I draw out the displayed formula, then It's a bit easier to see, isn't it? Well, if I could draw well, it would be easier to see. Let's try again. You've got this amine. It's got two hydrogen atoms there. And that's joined to a carbon. It's got two hydrogen atoms. And that's joined to a carbon. It's got a double bond. It's got a hydrogen atom there. And you've got that. And then you've, that's a carbon atom. You wouldn't believe <laughs> how difficult it is to use this. <laughs> Luckily, you're in the exam and you can use the pen. Oh, by the way, the examiner said students are using pencils. Okay? And the examiner said, that's no good. You've got to use pens. Okay? So if you're used to using a pencil, the examiner doesn't like that. You've got to use a pen. All right? And here I am, you know, with my difficult pen as well, so the examiner wouldn't like what I'm doing, but you've got to be using pens, not um, pencils. Um, so, okay, so that's it. So, <clears throat> I mean, if, if you draw out the displayed formula, it's much, much easier to see the sigma bonds and the pi bonds. Now, the pi bonds are in double bonds only, and you've got one pi bond there, haven't you? and you've got one pi bond there, okay? So those are your pi bonds, and there's just two of those. Easy stuff. Yeah? And because we've written out this displayed formula, instead of trying to do this in your head, which you could do, I suppose, if you were good at seeing things in your head, you could just count round now, couldn't you, all these sigma bonds that are in this molecule here. Okay, so let's count. You've got one, two, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I've done something wrong there. What am I doing wrong? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. What am I doing wrong? Because there's 14. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Three. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so this is a real mess now, isn't it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13, 14. Thank you very much. <laughs> Can you, and like if you were trying to do that in your head with just a skeletal formula, you'd probably lose it, wouldn't you? So um, drawing out the uh, displayed formula, um, you know, even then, if I was rushing, um, I would have missed that, wouldn't I? So that's, I think you could be quite careful at that point, but thanks for spotting that. Yeah, okay, 14, well done, thank you. All right, good. Now, <clears throat> Um, so when we looked at the skeletal formula just now, we had the amine functional group, we have the alkene, and we had the amide. All right. Now, it says we're going to do some reactions here, and the product of those reactions are soluble in water. And the examiner said, well, students should have picked up that earlier on we talked about an organic salt. Do you remember when you saw the diazonium salt up here, you had Cl minus and you had a plus there, yes? And you know from uh, your earlier studies in chemistry that when you have an ionic compound, then that's soluble in water. And so even though you've got uh, a mainly organic molecule here, because we've seen earlier about a salt, and it's talking now about being soluble in water, then we're getting a pretty big clue here that whatever we form should be an organic salt that's soluble in water. And that's the kind of clue that the examiner said that students didn't pick up. All right. And then uh, you've got a reaction here where you've just got an acid. All right. Now, the trick at this point is to know that the amine is a base. And a base and an acid, you know, from earlier studies in chemistry, acid and a base makes a salt and water. Okay, so that's going to be soluble in water. But you also need to know that the amide isn't basic. So the reaction is going to happen here, not here. All right. And so when you get uh, the reaction, then you're going to end up with you had. Uh, Let's go, what was it? It was, I'm now drawing the skeletal formula. You've got that. Is that right? No? When the screen is like this, it's difficult for me to scroll up, up and down. So you've got that. Happy with that? Yes? And this is not basic. So it's not reacting with the acid. But this is basic. So you've got an acid-base reaction, and you end up with a positive charge there and the negative there. So you've formed an ammonium salt. Yes? And because you've got a positive charge, the ammonium ion there, and the chloride ion, you formed an ammonium salt that is soluble in water, and all you did was react an acid with a base, or what's that called? You know, that's not A-level knowledge, you, you've met that before. It's a neutralization reaction when an acid and a base neutralize each other. Okay, <clears throat> so we've got that one. And then, uh, again, you've got to know that uh, in this reaction, You've got that uh, amine group there, and you've got the rest of the molecule, haven't you? Okay, there it is. And that lone pair of electrons there, well, up, up here, it reacted with the proton to make the uh, ammonium salt. But that lone pair of electrons, if we were drawing a mechanism, would come in and attack the bond that's just there. And so you've got um, a lone pair of electrons attacking a polar bond, so that's 
if we're drawing the mechanism, we don't have to draw the mechanism here, but we've talked about mechanisms a lot today. So <clears throat> that's, um, you've got, this is um, going for the positive charge there, isn't it? So it's, and we explained that earlier on the new, it's nucleophilic, isn't it? So you've got a nucleophile, which is there, attacking that bond there. And so this is a nucleophilic uh, substitution. Because the bromine is going to get broken off. We've substituted the bromine that was there with this whole molecule here. It's a nucleophilic substitution. Uh, and we end up with um, all of that. Um, I'll have to clean this up a bit now, won't I? You're going to have this CH3, CH2 there, and you've got the bromine there. And if you look carefully, how many bonds are on the nitrogen? One, two, three, four. Excuse my drawing, but you see what I mean. And when you've got four bonds on the nitrogen, then you've got a positive charge and you've got the negative charge on the bromine. And again, you've formed an ammonium salt, haven't you? Which is going to be soluble in water. So both of these are looking at the reaction of the amine. And <clears throat> both of them form an ammonium salt, which is soluble in water. First one, the neutralization. Second one, nucleophilic substitution. Good. All right. So then you uh, rattle through some questions about DNA and RNA. Uh, I think that's easy for you to look up in the mark scheme. Um, so um, I think all pretty easy to look up again. Um, now you just come down here to, there's a little bit of a question about X-ray crystallography. And when you do X-ray crystallography, the, what you end up with is a, a kind of picture which is called an electron density map. And if you see electron density map, you just it's a bit like seeing hot spots for where the electron density is most dense. All right. So, for example, um, if you did um, an electron dent, oh. <laughs> I've got to draw that again. If you did an electron density map of benzene, all right, what you'd actually end up seeing is kind of a hot spot there, 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 and there because those, that's where the electrons are around the carbon atom. Yeah, so that would be a kind of hotspot map or an X-ray crystallog crystal crystallography electron density map of a benzene ring. But we're not doing electron density map of benzene ring. We're doing the electron density map of ATP. All right? And so you've got to think, well, okay, out of all the chemicals in a ATP, or all the elements actually, or the atoms, which one is going to have the most electrons to give the most electron density? So adenosine triphosphate is, it's a sugar, isn't it? And it's got a, I'm just doing a sketch here. I haven't drawn the whole thing because it takes me ages to do, but you've got the sugar, which is the, um, uh, You've got a sugar there, and you've got a phosphate here, you've got an adenosine over here, and this uh, little ring system here is just carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. The adenosine is a base, so that's nitrogen, hydrogen, and carbon, and then the phosphate over here is phosphorus and oxygen. And so if we did an electron density map of ATP, which atom is going to have the most electrons? Look that up in your periodic table. The one that has the most electrons 
is the phosphorus. So which element will most strongly interact? It's going to be phosphorus, will have the most electrons, have the highest electron density in the electron density map that comes out of the X-ray crystallography. And then this is kind of the opposite question here. Well, the X-ray crystallography, in fact, isn't going to detect the hydrogens at all. Why not? Hydrogen only has one electron. There's hardly any electron density at all for hydrogen. And so the hydrogen is not detected in X-ray crystallography because hydrogen has one electron. So very small electron density. Okay, good. All right, good. So we're still struggling against the time here, aren't we? Okay, so I'm just going to quickly rattle through to this one here, all right, because we're running out of time. We just need to focus on things the examiners talked about. So there's uh, an amino acid here, all right? And you've got uh, amino acid has a central carbon. It has a carboxylic acid at one end, doesn't it? And it has an amino group at the other end, all right? And this amino acid happens to have this side chain. Okay, that's cysteine. We've, we've, we've just drawn it out. Okay, and it says if we draw an, an NMR spectrum, there's going to be five absorptions, which means five hydrogen environments. And you can count them. There's one hydrogen environment there, two, three, four, five. Five hydrogen environments. And that's why that gives five absorptions in its NMR spectrum. And then the scientist comes along and actually uses this deuterium oxide and it just gets two absorptions. And that's because the deuterium from there can replace these hydrogens. Sorry, not that one there. What am I doing? So we've got now. Uh, we've got D2 there, we had there, there, okay? The, there's been a replacement of a proton by deuterium. And if we look now, how many hydrogen environments are left? Well, we've got uh, one here, haven't we? And one here. So we get, and that's CH2, isn't it? So we've got two hydrogen environments, we get two peaks, and that's why. So <clears throat> we identify the protons, it's going to be that proton there and that proton there. And so the mark scheme says, well, there's one proton and two protons. So proton there and proton there. And then uh, just because um, we can see that this is a triplet here and this is a doublet. Okay. So because that hydrogen there is adjacent to a hydrogen that has two hydrogens on it, there's a rule that uh, you've got two hydrogens here, and so the splitting pattern is N plus 2. So because there's two hydrogen there, the splitting pattern for that will be N, what am I doing? N plus 1. <laughs> the rule is N plus 1. So because there's two hydrogens here, then the splitting pattern here will be 3, n plus 1. And because there's one hydrogen here, the splitting pattern here will be a doublet, n plus 1. So this is E is the CH, isn't it? And F is the CH2, because you get that splitting pattern uh, from the two hydrogens that are left behind. Good, okay, so... Well, I think the examiner basically said everything else was good. Uh, for this one, uh, you wanted to see the chiral center. So you had to want you to draw a circle around each chiral center. So that means an atom that's bonded to four different things. And although this is a skeletal structure, there's actually a hydrogen there, isn't there? 
and there's a hydrogen here as well. We can't see it in the skeletal structure. So we draw a ring around there, and we draw a ring around there. So the first part says, where's the chiral center? And then the second part, and the examiner complained about this, he said, you've got to draw an arrow to show the bonds that could be easily broken. And so a lot of students drew an arrow that pointed to a, an atom, but we've got to draw an arrow that goes to a bond. And so the bond that gets easily broken is that bond there, and the bond that get e gets easily broken is that bond there. All right, so the first part of the question wanted you to label up an atom. There it is. Second part of the question wanted you to label up a bond. There's a bond there and the bond there. So make sure when you're doing accurate labeling, you're labeling on an atom where he wants an atom or she wants an atom and a bond where the examiner wants a bond. All right, um, last one then. This seems to come up a lot, actually. We had this one in the test uh, the exam we did yesterday. They just seem to be asking about nano quite a lot. And you need to know that, uh, well, I'm going to get a pen to work, that milli is 10 to the minus 3, isn't it? Micro is 10 to the minus 6. Nano is 10 to the minus 9. If you keep going down, next one down is pico, that's 10 to the minus 12. And you can, sorry, minus 12. And you can keep on going if you wanted to down there. But so the nano range is just outside of the micro range down to the nano range. So um, that's 10 to the minus 7 to 10 to the minus 9. So that takes us sort of smaller than the micro down to the nano. And actually in the mark scheme in this one, they say that the nano size is 1 to 200 nanometers. And that's um, from 1 nanometer there up to 200 nanometers. Um, also, so that you could write that as 1 to 200 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. All right. And strange enough, last night's mark scheme had the nano range as 1 to 100 nanometers. But it's, it's basically making sure you haven't strayed up into the micro range and you've kept yourself as 1 nanometer, 10 nanometers, 100 nanometers. You're keeping yourself into the nanometer range. Good. All right. So we focused on what the examiner wants to see. And we've got through a two-hour paper in less than two hours, which is good. And if there's any questions, then, of course, I'll be delighted to follow that up uh, on the Slack channel afterwards. Good. Thanks for listening. And I wish you every success in your chemistry uh, studies and exams. Good. All right.